right, welcome to our last sprint of the day. Uh, already as an announcement, after this talk, there will be closing remarks, so don't leave, don't run away. There will be something in the auditorium, just make your way fast down there. And I mean, there's a, a tough last slot, we can already see some people had to leave, but what could be a better closing than to have some schadenfreude over other people's security fails? <laughs> Let's welcome our speaker. There you go. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Well, th thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Gustavo. Uh, people call me Puki. Uh, luckily, I learned that it doesn't mean anything in German because most places where I go, like, I was like, in your language, what does Puki mean? And sometimes it's not good, so very good. Uh, as I said, my name is Gustavo. Uh, I work at, at Cinta Infinita. I'm from Argentina. and together with, with Noel, who was giving the RFID NFC training. Uh, we have a small company there. We do mostly pen testing. We, like I began pen testing like 10 years ago, and now we do pen testing, but we also have our stuff, so that's good. Uh, I'm a computer science engineer. Uh, I'm also a snowboard teacher. I like playing guitar and other stuff, but how did this talk started. So, as I told you, I've been pen testing for about 10 years. Uh, eight years ago, I, I was mainly doing uh, web application pen testing. And one of the first, the, it came that one of the uh, banks in Argentina was the first one to have a mobile banking application. So they needed to pen test it. And my project leader came and said, have you ever pen tested an Android application? I was like, no. And he said, well, would you like to do it? I said, yes. And he said, OK, you're, now you're the mobile, mobile security specialist. And we have a meeting tomorrow. So <laughs> there I went, and I had to start uh, testing mobile applications. And the thing is that there was no, uh, not a lot of method, methodological information. Like uh, there was no OWASP project at that time. Uh, you could not get so many books about the subject. So I just started looking up what I could find, like blog posts and stuff. And three years later, uh, in 2013, uh, in Echo Party conference in Buenos Aires, I gave the first talk about uh, this stuff. That same year was the year that uh, the OWASP uh, mobile project came out. So we're going to talk a little about that. Then that talk started growing, and it became a full day training in 2015. And luckily, I've tested uh, quite a lot of, of mobile applications. So that's where this uh, talk comes from. So I, oh, it was uh, 2014. So the first mobile top 10 uh, from OWASP. You all know, oh, first of all, how many of you uh, work with something mobile related? How many of you develop mobile applications? OK, how many of you hack mobile applications? OK, it's good. Awesome. So uh, the other ones, you all know the, uh, mobile, uh, the web application top 10 from OWASP. So it's the 10 most common vulnerabilities. So this was the first uh, mobile application uh, top 10, which includes a lot of stuff. And uh, two years ago, in 2016, there was a new version which kind of looks a lot like it, but it didn't change so much. So what, what uh, did change? Uh, something I don't like a lot from, from the OWASP project, that they started using like broader categories. For example, improper platform usage. Oh, this is awesome. I didn't know this worked. <laughs> So uh, improper platform usage is uh, like a broad category where they put a lot of stuff. Uh, most like weak server side controls, but uh, we will discuss each one of these like right now. So the first one, improper platform usage. So this one encapsulates everything that is a, um, like a security feature provided by the operating system, but you don't use well when you program. For example, uh, touch ID, using the keychain, wrong uh, 
protection levels in Android or permissions. So the misuse of any security control that is provided from the operating system. So this is kind of new because uh, now the operating system is starting to give more uh, security functionality to developers. But it's often used wrong. So this is like the first one in the top 10. Insecure data storage. Uh, this used to be the first one in, at, in the first draft uh, of the top 10 project. So this is the unprotected storage of information. Uh, we see this a lot. And for example, uh, how many of you use uh, Twitter on your mobile phones? OK. How many of you know what information is actually stored in your mobile phone and what information is queried from, from the web services when, when you log in or when you read? Uh, we don't. We don't because as users, unless we have a rooted phone and we start digging, uh, we, we don't have access to that. We can't see what's stored in our phone. For example, the first time I opened the Twitter application uh, with root access, I realized that as soon as you log in, your whole history of direct messages is saved to a file on the device, even if you don't query it or whatever. It's just there, and it sits there. So I don't know why, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't start digging or, or looking. So we have uh, local storage. We have cloud storage. Uh, right now, we have, backup, we have like automatic backups. We have iCloud. We have uh, the, the Google Cloud. Uh, we have something that's a, a cache, like cache files for, for our, our web libraries. So every time we use, um, we do a, a web request, maybe uh, things get cached. So we will talk about this later. So and the other category that used to, there, was, there used to be a category uh, in the 2013 top 10 that was an intentional information leakage uh, by third parties, which is this. When you, like you're developing a mobile application and you need to, uh, I don't know, use a web client to connect to a web service or whatever. Uh, you're not going to code your web client. Usually you'll go and download Chromium or any other like web kit uh, stuff. And this, uh, usually you, you'll have to configure this. So maybe it's doing like writing some logs or cache files or temp files that you are not under control because you didn't code the library. So that's covered by this one. Insecure communication. This is really common. So apps that communicate in plain text, for example, or uh, they use TLS SSL, but they use weak ciphers. And the most common one is not responding securely when an invalid certificate is presented. So when, you, when you're on your browser on your computer, if you access a site that has uh, an invalid certificate, you will get an error. Now it will say invalid certificate. What happens if your app, any app, finds an invalid certificate? It depends. It depends on what the, the guy who coded it, or the guy who coded the SSL library, or the, so maybe you will get an error saying, I can't connect. Maybe you will get uh, no error and it would <laughs> just connect, which happens. Uh, or maybe you will get a warning like this and you'll see, OK, I, this, there's this error with the certificate. I can continue or I can stop. So this is pretty common. Number four and number six, these are insecure authentication and authorization. This used to be uh, just one, uh, and now they have been split. Uh, so. We all know this for any application. If, you're, if you, there's no good authorization, for example, uh, you're not logged in, but you can access uh, something. Or if you can access stuff from other users, we will see some examples from, from this. Uh, so session management, anything that has to do with authentication and authorization is covered by this one. Insufficient cryptography. This is something that. It's not only to mobile applications. We've seen some good talks on cryptography uh, with the uh, SAP examples. Uh, so something to remember always, encoding is not encryption. Obfuscation is not encryption. Serialization is not encryption. <laughs> Just because you can't read it, it doesn't mean that it's, it's encrypted. So when some cryptography is attempted but it isn't done correctly, 
this is the category it falls on. For example, you encode, uh, you, you cipher uh, something, and you leave the key in a file that is accessible by the attacker. So that doesn't work. Uh, and this is a big one. Programming your own crypto is usually a bad idea unless you're a crypto guy. So unless you, you're doing it because you want it, it's a bad idea. Uh, an example of this, I was trying to think of any mobile application that uh, used this. And I remembered a case uh, from Argentina, which was there was uh, an app that you can use to get um, the place you have to vote, to go to vote. So uh, when, you, when you took a look at the traffic, it would be a get. Uh, a GET request with some weird string uh, as a parameter. So someone, it was actually it was a 16-year-old guy who just download the, downloaded the APK, uh, reversed it, and found this. So codificar means encode or encrypt. And actually, if you see what's, what this is doing, it's, it's taking the string, like uh, the, str the string was the, um, the parameters. So it will base64 encoded it. It will reverse it. It will replace A, E, I, O, and U by some characters. Then it will reverse it again. And then it will <laughs> base64 encode it again and change again the, par the parameters. And then it will reverse it and just give it to you. So this was like solved with an Excel. <laughs> there was an Excel file to decode this. So. No, like doing this kind of crypto is not good. It's not good. <laughs> so uh, client code quality. This is one that I really don't like. Because actually, it makes it like these broad categories make it hard for us to teach them. So if I have to teach uh, how to re not fall into this category, it's like this is a catch-all category for anything uh, like buffer overflow, uh, overflow, format strings, anything that's uh, code running on the device and normal vulnerabilities. Code tampering. So this is another quite uh, broad category, but it involves binary patching. Uh, so many times you will see, well, we saw a, a talk yesterday talking about using Frida to subvert some stuff. Uh, then uh, local resource modifications, just use, using all this uh, stuff to bypass security measures. You know? So method hooking, for example, if you have an authentication uh, method and you can hook into the uh, method that checks the password and just say return true, for example, that would be method hooking. Or dynamic memory modifications uh, are some examples of code tampering. Reverse engineering. You see that the categories are getting really like uh, not not very punctual. So uh, binary analysis, reversing. We'll see this. So why do we like to reverse? Because doing source code analysis uh, it makes easier to understand the, the underlying logic of the application, and it's easier to find vulnerabilities and maybe information leakage. We'll see examples about this in a minute. And number 10 is extraneous functionality, like anything that isn't supposed to be there. Back doors, uh, security controls that uh, are not intended for, for production, uh, weird debugging code, uh, for example, some app that if you did a, press some, some keys would display a debugging uh, shell where you could do whatever. Uh, and for example, in, in hybrid applications where you have JavaScript code, uh, sometimes you find comments and you find passwords and stuff like that. So, some cases in the news. So I try to get uh, some famous cases first, and then we're going to talk about some cases that I worked on personally. These are two really, really, really interesting uh, research that are made by, were made by IOActive. The first one is. Uh, about uh, mobile application that connect to uh, SCADA networks uh, and SCADA devices. And if you see, there you have the, like the top 10 categories and how many findings each one of these had and the per like the percentage of the apps. For, for example, uh, in secure communication, you have 38% of the apps were doing that. And in secure data storage, 47. So all of them had something that was bad. And this one, uh, 
the one about trading applications was made by my friend uh, Alejandro Hernandez from Mexico. Uh, so he did the same, but he took the, like, the most used trading uh, applications. And for example, one thing that you could see is the SSL certificate validation. So 62% uh, of the apps failed. So actually, you're, you're trading money <laughs> and your stocks with an application that can easily be money in the middle. So that's uh, like these kind of studies show that uh, there's uh, the maturity level of mobile security is no, of mobile app security is not big. Uh, I talk about mobile app security because it, it's totally independent or mostly independent from the operating system security. So what everything we will cover uh, today is the developer's fault <laughs> or some developer's fault, but not the OS. So, for example, who here uses Tinder? Ah, Lucky. <laughs> OK. Who here knows what Tinder is? All right. <laughs> yeah, we never used it. Me neither. <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> my girlfriends won't watch the video, so. <laughs> so, have you ever heard of the, the first Tinder vulnerabilities? OK, Tinder lets you uh, find people near you. So there was actually uh, the first version of, of the application you would send uh, a request to the server saying, OK, I'm here with your latitude and your longitude, your coordinates. And uh, it would give you an array of people that were near you with their coordinates. And they were really, really, really precise. So you could actually just say, OK, and you could spoof that and say, OK, I'm somewhere else. And it would give you the coordinates of people. So you see where this is going. You could track people. So then what they did was they, they changed it to just one value of distance. But they used a really precise number. It was a double or a long or something like that. So you could actually triangulate, because you can spoof your location. So you could say, OK, now I'm here. What's the distance to this guy? And now I'm here. What's the distance to this guy? So you could actually do exactly the same with three requests. So then what they finally did is they took the precision out of there. So it they gives you like, I don't know, I, I think it's like 100 meters. So you would say, OK, it's, he's somewhere over here. But it was quite uh, noisy in the news. So there was, a, there was also even a web app where you could just track someone. And it would use <laughs> Tinder. So here, for example, you, we have reverse engineering and insecure data storage. Uh, who heard about this one, Strava? It was like three months ago, two months ago. So uh, this fitness tracking app, uh, it's actually using the cloud service to record where you, where you run or where you go. And as they wanted to promote the usage of their app, they, they made a global heat map of the places in the world where there was more people doing exercise. And there were some weird places that actually lit up like this. And they turned out to be military bases, CIA places, and stuff like that. So this was, uh, I don't know if insecure storage, but something that shouldn't have been stored, maybe. I don't know. This one was kind of noisy. So do you know Twilio? So Twilio is, a, is a, um, an app or a company that uh, provides services for, for call and SMS. So for example, if your app needs to deliver a token or something, you would use their service to deliver SMS or to call uh, the person with a code or whatever. So uh, about, uh, there was uh, some, I think it was uh, AT&T, uh, no, T-Mobile uh, apps that were using uh, Twilio. And they were actually invoking the Twilio API directly from the phone. So the API key was on the phone. And it was not a restricted API key, but an API key that could do whatever you wanted. So actually, if you, you downloaded the app, you reversed it, you took the key, and then you could log into Twilio and see like every uh, call or every SMS that was sent uh, by that. And it turned out that at least uh, 100 million installations on Android phones of those applications. So it was uh, 685 apps they discovered uh, that had, uh, like, uh, I think it was 
20 or 30 API keys from different companies. One of them was reused in eight applications. So if you hacked one, you could see the, the messages from all of them. Uh, and this one reminds me of one I saw, uh, what was it, a month ago, I think. Um, I was testing an application, and there was no, it was really, really, really well done because uh, they were using, it was a, it's a startup, and they were using third-party services for everything, so they were using an identity management uh, cloud service that was good, and they were using an other services. And I couldn't find any like uh, authorization vulnerabilities or whatever like that. And then I saw um, a button that said, report a problem. So if you click that, an email was sent. So when I started looking uh, at how this was done, uh, it was done exactly this way. But they were not using Twilio, they were using MailChimp. MailChimp has a, um, um, services, a service called uh, Mandrill, and Mandrill actually lets you, gives you an API to send emails. So they were invoking directly the, that API from the client code, and they had the, like the, the API key. So they were using that API key to call the send mail endpoint of the API. So I just checked and I was like, okay, I was uh, list the last 50 messages and it would give me the last 50 messages. And they were using that same API, uh, that same API key to send uh, the password reset and the welcome, the welcome message with the password. So actually by that vulnerability, uh, the application got totally pwned because you would take any user ask for a, re a reset password, the email would be sent, but you would just catch it from the, from the API and you would use it. So you could reset any password of, or any, of any user. So, now we'll talk a little bit about stuff that I personally found. Uh, most of the cases would be anonymized because there's NDAs and stuff like that. Uh, but, K0 is the ones, I call it the ones they all share. Because uh, almost, I don't know, 90% of the applications I've tested had some of this, or did this at some, ex at some extent. So, sensitive information written to logs. Both Android and iOS have um, their log, like a syslog, that if you have physical access to the device, you can just plug and read. So. Uh, anything that gets uh, written there could be accessed by uh, attackers, for example. So in the first case, we have uh, user and password from the, from the web service. Here we have a password there too, and a client code, uh, single sign-on stuff, and access token. So something that's good about uh, getting uh, authentication tokens from mobile apps is that they really, really last a long time. How, when was the time that you, the last time you had to re-log in, for example, your Twitter account or whatever in your phone? It's just done once. So if you catch one of these, uh, you could actually impersonate the user forever, mostly. And the other one, so this is logs, and the other one is cache files. So as I told you, uh, if you use, for example, CF URL in, in iOS to, to connect, or uh, oh, these two cases are from CF URL, uh, maybe you use Chromium, uh, and the, the server doesn't, ha uh, doesn't add the proper um, cache headers, or cache protection headers, you could get stuff like this. There's a file called cachedb where uh, the, the cache uh, gets uh, stored, and you could actually find something like this one, authentication password, and then you have the account and the password, or any, anything that was sent or received by the, by the user. Uh, usually cache, uh, you're supposed to use it because if, if you want to, for example, retrieve images or whatever, it makes it really faster. But this kind of <laughs> request shouldn't, should never be cached. So that was case zero. We're going to like we're going from uh, low criticity to we will start getting a little bit higher. So this one was a mobile banking app for Android and iOS. 
Uh, I call it Franco 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you will see why. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about uh, Android uh, code reversing, the Java part of Android. So actually, uh, if you download an APK, the APK is a zip file, so you can uh, take uh, everything from there. And there's usually a DEX, uh, always, not usually, there's a file called classes.dex, which holds the Java classes in a DEX format, which is a Dalvik executable. So it's an executable file uh, format for Android. But it's not, it's not um, machine code. It's Java, so you can actually reverse it and get the, the actual code. So you can use, uh, to download an APK, you can use any, any tool like Pure APK, APK Downloader, or install it in your device and take it from the uh, slash data uh, slash app directory. Uh, then you, you could use njarify or dex to jar to reverse it to a jar file, and then you can open the jar file with JDGUI or JDCME, CMD. So in this case, we did that. We took the, the code from the home banking application, from the mobile banking application, and the code was not obfuscated. So we could, get, we could read it. And what was found there? So the first thing uh, is that string, where the path was from the developer, and it was like, users, Franco, Dropbox, Devel, uh, mobile banking, the name of the bank, and the whole like source code. Uh, so this was not, uh, the bank was not happy when they saw this, because it was like, hey, my whole project is in Dropbox. Why? Uh, Franco must also not have been happy when this report was <laughs> delivered. <laughs> but well, it was just some information that we could take. But looking further, we have this class. Verificar recurso means verify resource in Spanish. So actually, what it said, it, it, it helped like four calls to test login user with a number and one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, you can actually start seeing where this goes. Uh, our, our test users were numbers like those. So we were like, OK, let's try that. Enter that number in the login form and one, two, three, four, five, six, and there were test accounts from the bank with money and stuff. So imagine if this gets pushed to the Google Play Store, the first guy that downloads it and decompiles it, uh, which should be within hours, uh, you would have access to, to those accounts. So yeah, this was a bad one. And actually, it wasn't used anywhere. They just forgot it in the path when they made the APK, so it got loaded. But this, this wasn't invoked. Anyway, what they told us is that, no, no, we were using this to verify if the web service was on. <coughs> OK. <laughs> okay. So case two. Uh, this one is called Give Me the Pin. Uh, it was a mobile payment app that you could use to, to pay stuff and send money, and also on Android and iOS. So. Here we will discuss this thing called sandbox. You all know what a sandbox is, or I hope. Uh, so it's measures designed to ensure that one app cannot access other apps' data. So in Android, uh, both in Android and in, in iOS, this is uh, managed by uh, operating system file permissions. So actually, every app has only access to its data. And uh, they cannot, for, uh, let me show you. Real quick, uh, for example, I have an Android phone here, and I'm going to access a ADB shell. This is rooted, so I can actually go up to root. So if you go to slash data slash data, and you do this, uh, so you will see that uh, these are all the applications that are installed, and each one has. Uh, a user with a number, A95, which is a user that is created at the Android, at the, like the Unix level of the Android operating system, uh, when the app is installed. And the permissions say that only that user can access the, the files there. So only that user and root. So actually, on, only one, um, one application can access its, its data directory. 
There's an exception uh, if a developer wants two of, their, of his own applications to access uh, another ones, that he owns both of them. So he can add some flags at the, um, at the Android manifest. And the, the second application will get assigned the same username. So they will have permissions. So uh, this is what protects uh, one application to ask, uh, from being asked by another one. So how do uh, these applications store data? Mostly they use uh, this thing called shared preferences, which are XML files with keys and values, and uh, SQLite databases. In Apple, uh, the directory is another one, that's that. And instead of shared preference, they use the Apple plist format, which is almost like an XML. So when I had this app, uh, it came with its own pin lock. So if you left your device uh, unlocked and you wanted to access that application to make a payment, uh, you would get a pin lock that was uh, inside the application. So the pin number was stored locally at those paths. So at an, a setting, settings XML file in Android and a plist file in Apple. So. First of all, client side checks, bad. So we will see why in, in a minute. But this should be protected by the sandbox, right? Yes, right, OK. Yeah, well, we have this thing called backups. So, mm, so an Android app can choose if it allows its data to be back up, backed up. Uh, local backups or cloud backups. And when it does, it breaks the sandbox, the sandbox protection. Uh, so for example, you can, through ADB, so this was protecting a phone that was uh, unlocked, the, the, the pin uh, code screen. So you could just uh, plug it in through ADB and do a backup and then access it. And there you saw the, you see that the pin code is there. So <clears throat> I wanted to demo something like this. Uh, and I couldn't, for ex of course, I couldn't use this application because the client would kill us. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started doing some research that I hope uh, becomes a talk someday uh, about, have you ever seen these uh, applications that claim to protect your private pictures? So they say, OK, install this application, and there's a pin lock. And you can save your private photos there, and they, will, they won't be hacked like it happened to the famous people. So I started analyzing how many of these applications actually did some crypto. They all say that you're secure and security and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I found that one that was uh, really nice. OK, so that's this. You should be seeing the same screen as I am. So there's, this is called Photobolt. Uh, it asks you to create a pin, and I will create a four-digit pin, one, three, three, seven. Pin created, okay, let's test it. Okay. What was your childhood nickname? Pookie. <laughs> so it also has a, a security like question, which we will see that it's bullshit. But set. OK, so now I'm inside the bolt. So I will take a naughty picture of you guys. Let's see. Where does, ah, there you go. Chick. Wow. OK, so now that picture, we don't want anyone to see it, so we will protect it. <laughs> so we will go into Photo Bolt. We will add the picture. So there we go, recent pictures, it's added. And we quit the application. If we go to the camera roll, it shouldn't be there. Uh, where is it? Photos, somewhere, gallery, Gale ga gallery. So it says there are no photos. OK. So let's say I'm an attacker. First of all, I'm going to 
I'm going to download the, the APK. I already have it in my desktop, so I will do uh, uh, so uh, hide photo locker there. So that's, that's the app. So I will do APK tool. So what I want to do is I extract the, um, the manifest to see if it supports backup. So I'll do APK 2D, which is um, like decompile. And it was, what was it? Hide photo log. Yeah. So this takes the, all the files. Uh, failed. I don't know why. Let's see if it took the manifest photo. OK. Uh, hide photo locker. LS, no, L, oh yeah, 100 manifest. So we'll do cat 100 manifest. Uh -huh. Let's do it again. And we will find the application. It's here, application Android allow backup, true. So even if this is not uh, specifically set to true, the default value is true. So actually, you have to disable it. So. I said, OK, we can back up. Uh, we can extract the information if we have. Uh, so we, ha we get an analog phone. We go and we try to look at the pictures, and there's no pictures. We go to the, to the photo bolt, and it asks for a pin code. We don't have it. 1111 one, one, one. Uh, won't work. Wrong pin. So what can we do? We just plug the USB cable if the Developer options are not uh, are not on. We can turn them on. Uh, I will exit this because I'm rude here. Exit. Oh, uh, so if I do ADB shell, so it, this root, this phone shouldn't be rooted. So if I do ADB shell, I will get a shell uh, user. And if I go ls slash data slash data uh, permission denied, so I can't read the contents of the of the file because it's protected by the sandbox. So what I will do is I will exit this, and I will invoke a backup. So I will do adb backup. And uh, I have to give it the, like the, packet name of, uh, the package name of the application, which was com a a p -p 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 photo bolt. So I'll do backup this. OK, it says, unlock your device and confirm. Uh, if you see my device here, it says, confirm. Do you want to set a password? I don't, because I'm stealing the data. So, <laughs> so uh, copy my pop-up. And it should be backed up. So what it does is it creates uh, a backup.ab file, which is actually uh, it's a tar file zipped uh, with zlib. Uh, and with a header of 24 bytes. So there's a, there's a small comment that I usually have written somewhere. It should be here. Oh, shit. OK. So it should be here. So what you can do is uh, UDD just skipping the first 24 bytes, and then you use some Zlib. Uh, library to uh, decompress it. So the one that I like the most, because mostly, uh, many times, OpenSSL doesn't have CLIB support, uh, is this one. It's a Python one-liner where we just take this and we create, we convert the backup to a tar file. And then we do tar xbf backup.tar. And something came there. OK, so let's take a look. We have an image file. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. We have password.xml, security question, security answer. Recovery said, so let's first cut the um, password. Uh, and that, there's the 1337. So I could access it now if I want. But uh, I have, if I do. So uh, let's see, apps, uh, uh -huh. and then this is 
baseball. Oh, look at this. Hey, there's two people. So actually, yeah. <laughs> there was, and this is an old photo that I had already deleted. Well, okay, this is a new one. <laughs> so even if you delete it <laughs> from, <laughs> from the app, it stays there. OK, that, that, that wasn't expected. I, I cleared like the whole phone before the demo. So. Show it again, just in case. <laughs> It wasn't naughty. <laughs> so OK, so most of the time I, I present any of these like backup findings to developers. They go like, what? Because they, they really don't know that this could be done. Usually, if uh, the operating system lets you backup stuff, you see it as something good. But sometimes it can totally subvert the security of your application. OK, case three. Another pin bypass. So uh, this was a management console application for a really, really, really big cloud service uh, for iOS. Uh, so the user interface is, again, protected with a pin lock. And in iOS, you can't uh, do reversing like you can do in Java. So you won't get a Java code or uh, the um, Objective-C code because it's actually compiled to machine code. So you, can't, you can do that. But what you can do is um, something called class dumping, which allows you to get the header files of any uh, Objective-C library. So you would get a file with the declaration of any methods and uh, any variables that are hold, uh, held in the, um, in the classes. Uh, but you won't get the implementations. So you'll see, OK, there's a method called I don't know, security checks, but you won't see what it holds. Uh, what you can do then is function hooking. Uh, who was yesterday at the Chris Leroy talk about Android? OK. So he was talking about Frida. And Frida is, um, is really good for doing this uh, in Android and in iOS. So you can actually, if you, if you have uh, to this, you have to have a jailbroken device. So it's uh, an additional layer of. Uh, difficulty, but what you can do is uh, get into the into the process memory, and from there you can invoke methods or you can rewrite these methods. So, in this case, the class dump showed the following definition of uh, the password passcode verification view controller, which is the one that showed the the pin lock. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff, blah 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 blah, blah and then we see that there's two void methods that said passcode was correct and passcode was incorrect. Usually, you would see a, a, a method that would return a Boolean, uh, a Boolean value saying, uh, I don't know, check password, for example. Uh, and then what you would do is you would rewrite that method as return true, and then you could enter any password and bypass that. But in this case, it was really weird, because what you could do is you could actually uh, inject yourself, for example, with SciCrypt, which is uh, an application using uh, Cydia substrate for code injection. And then you would say, OK, choose the first instance of passcode verification view controller and access passcode was correct. And then the screen would just disappear. What was wrong here? In both cases, when I said client side checks are bad, what they should have done is actually taken the, the value of the pin and use it to, to create another key, like uh, to, de to derive a key from there and cipher the, and encrypt the, the data below. So that even if you can just erase the pin screen, the data won't be accessible. So in this case, it was just, it's just a dummy wall that you can move, and then the data is there. So when you do any kind of um, client-side checks, you must know that if the device is rooted or jailbroken, that can be moved. So, so no, like for really uh, security critical operations, client side checks won't suffice. Case four. <laughs> this one, this was a fun one. Okay, it's a mobile payment app. We're we're getting into uh, applications that move money, and when this happens, it's like. You get the itch, you know? When you, when you find a bone, you go like, ah, someone could make a lot of money with this. 
So <laughs> it was a mobile payment app also for Android and iOS. The app used the REST service to read and modify the user's financial information. For example, it would call user financial information with a user ID, and the mobile client would send the authorization HTTP header with the actual token, but the server wasn't even looking at it. So you could just delete the whole header, and that request would go fine. So I was like, OK, what if someone does this GET request from a browser? And then we got this one. <laughs> so you could actually just call it, and it will give you uh, the credit card mask number, and the balance, and any transfers. And you know, if there wasn't authentication uh, checks, of course, there are no authorization checks because there's no header saying who you are. So you could actually change the user ID and dump like everything. No? But OK, so this was big. But I was like, hey, we can't get the credit card numbers. You know, that's the, <laughs> that's the loot. So that's what we, <laughs> we get to the point of sale apps. Uh, who has ever used one of these? Like with a small uh, square thing? OK. These are really good because if you have a small shop or, I don't know, you, you send something in the street or whatever, uh, you can actually buy a small device from, from your uh, credit card uh, merchant, and uh, you could actually make payments through the app. The thing is, like the the um, the reader device is really good. So it, it used the app used uh, EMB certified CAD readers that use uh, this DUKPT encryption. So DUKPT. What, what it does is uh, it's called derived unique key per transaction. So there's each transaction is encrypted with a new uh, key, which can't be uh, known. So even if you are able to break the encryption of the data for, from one transaction, it will just be that transaction. Yeah? And uh, these keys are derived from one master key, which is called base derivation key. And uh, this is stored security, securely in the reader device. So there's a HSM or a tamper-proof TPM. So you can't get it from there. And it's stored at the other side, at the merchant. So when you swipe your card, the data gets encrypted in the reader device. It won't get, ever get to your phone. So all you can see is uh, like the name and the stuff it displays, maybe the masked card number. but nothing else, uh, and it will be sent uh, encrypted. So it was like, OK, this, the, um, I cannot get any data from these requests, even if I do a man in the middle. But when I saw that I couldn't get anything from the uh, payment flow, I saw that there was a, um, at least previous payments uh, endpoint. So you had the option to see the previous payments that you had done. Uh, so the, the HTTP request uh, was going with a JSON object that was this one. So you see it sorted uh, in an inverted way. Uh, it gets page one, and it said, OK, the filter is commerce ID equals 538, user ID equals 3, and status equals 1, because it would only get uh, the ones that were good. So. <laughs> What would you do now? <laughs> what happened was, in this case, there was an authorization header contained uh, with a token, but the server would only check, check uh, it for authentication. So it would say, OK, you are an, an, an authenticated user. But if you changed, for example, the commerce ID, it will just bring the data from another commerce ID. So this was bad. But then I said, OK, so I have to go from 1 to, I don't know, 1,000. And I was like, hey, this is JSON. So JSON, you can actually manipulate it a lot. And you could actually do this. No filter. <laughs> so I sent this one. And at first, I thought the application had crashed because the result was not coming back. <laughs> and then I was like, hmm, maybe it's getting bigger. Uh, so I got like, I don't know, 100 megs of JSON data. Uh, 
And it was like, yeah, I have everything that was at the payments database for any user. But the really big problem, OK, so yeah, this was a good face palm. <laughs> the really big problem was when I started analyzing that information. So this was one instance of one uh, payment made. So the application would just show you, OK, the name, the mask card number, and the uh, amount. But then you had uh, IP address here, like latitude, longitude, uh, some more information about the card holder. Well, this is normal. And then I saw this part where it says device. And it would say device ID. And it, whoa, oh no, that's OK. I thought <laughs> it's something that worked. Uh, and it gave you some information from the, from the device. And then I started looking at this. Do you see something weird here? No, look closely. B, D, K. That stands for base derivation key. <laughs> so when I saw that, I was like, OK, this can't be real. Is that the real base derivation key uh, at the device? So I called, I, I called, took, took my red phone, and I called the guys and said, OK, look at this. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's it. So actually, someone was <laughs> returning. I don't know why they were returning uh, this object. Uh, when I, OK, there you go. So <laughs> That's, that's the face palm we need here. Uh, so when I told the guys, they said uh, that the developer didn't know what BDK was. And actually, because they were on the other side. Uh, and actually, they were, what happens, usually happens here with these uh, APified applications, it's that usually they just say, OK, we need this, this uh, value and this value. OK, we have this object. We will just JSON stringify it and send it back. So they send a lot of additional information that the user shouldn't have, but because the application isn't showing it, it's like it's okay. So in the back they were, so with this, uh, with let's see, with this vulnerability I could get all the data which was encrypted, and with the other one I could get the base derivation key to decrypt it. So actually now all the credit card numbers were mine. Uh, so this was uh, like a really bad one. So OK, how can we avoid this? Uh, as I told you, uh, when I started uh, giving talks about um, mobile security, mobile application security, uh, this part was really hard because there was not a lot of documentation. Uh, when the first top 10 uh, from OWASP came, uh, there was a, a team that was um, part OWASP and part ENISA. Uh, which created a document that was the tom top 10 controls and design principles, which was actually 10 controls to fight the 10 vulnerabilities in the OWASP top 10. Right now, uh, like two months ago, OWASP released the MASBS. Have you ever seen the ASBS? The uh, Web Application Security Verification Standard? So this is a set of um, well, it's a project that was laid, uh, led by Berhan Mueller and Sven Schleier. Uh, in January this year, it hit uh, version 1.0. A team of our, our, our friends from Uruguay already translated to Spanish, if you want to read it in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you can translate it to German right now. Uh, this is really new. It has just been pushed. Uh, and it's really useful for, for example, uh, if you want to do security definitions during the life cycle of development. Uh, when you're doing pen testing, to ensure completeness, to ensure that you're, you're checking everything that should be checked. And uh, if you're if you in, in procurement, you're, you're finding some vendor, and you want their application to be secured, you can say, OK, you have to comply with this. Uh, and it maps to a sibling project, which is the mobile testing guide. And this is one of the documents that we have been expecting the most. It's still not uh, in, in version one, one I think. Uh, it's a work in progress, but it's getting really good. You should, all, all of this is uh, on GitHub, and the, all the projects, like, like every OWASP projects, are open. Um, 
there's a Slack channel where you can join, and there's discussion about this, and you can just the, the good thing about the, the testing guide is that you can, you can go there and see, OK, how could I check for, I don't know, wrong cryptography or stuff being written somewhere. And if you have a better way that you do it, you could add it to the document. And it's just a compendium of uh, testing techniques. So it has these control categories. Uh, and for each one, uh, you have the checks that you should do. There are two levels. So level one is a baseline. So almost uh, every, every application should comply with a level one. If you want to have a defense in depth, like a more critical inf uh, application, for example, a mobile bank, you should do level two. And if you uh, need to um, protect, for example, against reversing, uh, reverse engineering or whatever, there's the, uh, the R section which lists uh, all these kind of checks. And then, so you have like this kind uh, of, for example, security controls are never enforced only on the client side. This is what I was telling. Uh, so this is good for level one and level two. So this has to happen. Uh, and my conclusion, uh, every time I, I, I give this uh, kind of talks, uh, just the years. I have to change like 2017 and 2007, because it looks like we're always 10 years back. We are seeing vulnerabilities in mobile apps that we were seeing in web applications 10 years ago. For example, that you could change, just change a parameter, and you would get the accounts from other people. Uh, and I think this happens because uh, the mobile app uh, developers are really young right now. For example, for most of the banks I have worked with, uh, the web development or the normal application development team has at least 10 years of experience in banking applications, and the mobile guys are just out from college uh, because they are, they are doing the new technologies. So we need to work a lot uh, on getting uh, more secure mobile application development. Any questions? Can we have one? Yeah, I think we're good in time. OK. Well, yeah. Oh, is it's, it on? Yeah. So, from um, your experience, would you say that one platform has worse apps than the other platform, and what are the reasons? Hmm. Okay. Uh, first, first flame war of the conference, finally. What? <laughs> first flame war of the conference. Yeah. Finally. Uh, no, I would say no. Uh, mostly. Uh, the like the hardest vulnerabilities, the one that you say ah, are shared because they are on the back end. So most of the ones that allow you to like you have an iOS application and an Android application, but they are they are both hitting the same endpoints usually, uh, or the same API. So if you find a vulnerability that lets you uh, I don't know uh, get into another user's account, usually you could just well you could just use uh, a console to access the the endpoint and that. Uh, there are a lot of security mechanisms. The thing is, when you, talk about and when you talk about iOS, you're always talking about the latest version. So uh, all the devices should have the latest version and the, the same security capabilities. The thing with Android is that uh, the, it's, you, you have a lot in the world, a lot of devices that are running Android 4, Android 5. And it has to be backward compatible. So maybe uh, some of the protections are not available for those devices. Uh, but I wouldn't say that Android is better than iOS or anyone else. I, I'm like in the middle. I've seen horrible stuff in both of them. Any other questions? 